Hello, everybody. Good to be with you. Father Byron Hagen, Holy Cross. And uh, we're here today to reflect a little bit on the month of May as the month of Mary. And, uh, you know, we, we just had a Marian feast uh, yesterday, the feast of Our Lady of Fatima. But we know this is a new feast. And it's um, uh, the question is, uh, in, on a, in a larger sense, why May? Uh, for Mary's month, and why give her a month at all? And before I start in uh, with my own theories about this, I really want to leave that aside, and I want to turn to a poet who answered this question at least as well as, as any I've heard. Uh, this is a great poet, uh, Jared Manley Hopkins, who was writing, goodness, over 150, 160 years ago at least, right around the time of the founding of St. Anthony Parish, Jared Manley Hopkins is an Irish Jesuit, a priest in Ireland, and he was secretly a poet who wasn't known in the English-speaking uh, world until some time after his death, in which uh, collections of his poems were found, and little by little, um, people who really know about poetry, you know, professors and other poets, had started reading these, and they said, hey, this fellow might be the greatest uh, one of the greatest poets of the English, of uh, modern English of our time. And this is certainly how he's thought of uh, writing in the 19th century. And uh, some of his poems are so good, they put them in the breviary. So I'm gonna read this poem called The May Magnificat by Jared Manley Hopkins. And uh, if you wanna ask the question to yourselves while you're listening to this, why is uh, May the month of Mary? Father Hopkins is gonna let us know. May is Mary's month, and I muse at that and wonder why. Her feasts follow reason, dated due to season. Candlemas, Lady Day, but the Lady Month, May. Why fatten that upon her with a feasting in her honor? Fasten, not fat. It is only its being brighter than the most are must delight her? Is it opportunist and flowers find soonest? Ask of her, the mighty mother. Her reply puts this other. Question, what is spring? Growth in everything, flesh and fleece, fur and feather, grass and green world altogether. Star-eyed, strawberry-breasted, throstle above her nested. Cluster of bugle blue eggs thin, forms and warms the life within, and bird and blossom swell in sod or sheath or shell, all things rising, all things sizing, Mary sees, sympathizing with that world of good, nature's motherhood. Their magnifying of each its kind with delight calls to mind how she did in her stored, magnify the Lord. Well, but there was more than this, spring's universal bliss. Much, had much to say to offering Mary May. When drop of blood and foam dapple, bloom lights the orchard apple. And thicket and thorpe are merry with the silver surfed cherry. And azuring over gray bell makes Wood banks and brakes wash wet with lakes, and magic cuckoo call, caps, clears, and clinches all. This ecstasy, all through mothering earth, tells Mary her mirth till Christ's birth. To remember an exultation in God who was her salvation. Jared Manley Hopkins. Sometimes you might ask, uh, why write poetry? Uh, poetry is a little bit uh, like uh, singing. We want to make words sing and rhythm sing. This is why uh, musicians, composers often set the text of poems uh, to music. This might be a particularly hard one to set to music, but the music of the poem has to be a fitting to the subject. And one of the things we see here, maybe the main 
uh, thing that this poem wants to communicate. I urge you to look this up online. Jared Manley Hopkins, the May Magnificat, uh, is he's talking about nature and the beauty of nature in its unity, but also in its diversity. And the way that uh, in the month of May, the May being spring, that new life and nature flowers forth and, and bursts upon us uh, just in time uh, for, uh, to relieve us of that kind of sense of foreboding and hibernation and even thoughts of death that winter puts upon us. Uh, that spring comes forward and says, hey, you know, life is here too. And life has the last word. The poet isn't um, saying that Mary is a kind of personification of nature. He's not saying that at all. He's not saying, well, some people may say Mother Nature, uh, Catholics may say the Blessed Virgin Mary, but these two are the same. This is not what he's saying. What he is saying is that nature does have a motherhood and that Mary is queen of this as well. And we know She's called uh, in our Catholic faith, the queen of heaven and earth, the queen of heaven and earth. And so he, he says, celebrate the earth, we celebrate nature, we're celebrating what God has done also in the Blessed Virgin Mary. And what he's done in her, he's done in the church. That means for all of us who are baptized in the death of Christ, we're renewed in abundant new life, uh, sprouting everywhere, uh, new life moving and growing and uh, diverse in all of its kinds and at the same time one and unified in God as creator and in Mary our mother. And this is, um, this is really the, uh, the point about the Blessed Virgin Mary, before we say anything else about her, uh, and we know that she has many titles, the devotion of the church uh, multiplies her titles uh, over the centuries as it dwells upon uh, the mystery of Mary. The most important title, which was the first one uh, that was given to her uh, in the early church, is Mother of God. Mother of God. We have Feast of the Mary, Mother of God, January 1st. And um, we call her the Mother of God. And here's how that title came about, just to kind of refresh your memory. First of all, the church in this council of Ephesus, they weren't thinking about Mary, okay? They weren't debating about Mary. They, weren't, they didn't call the council to say, let's see what we have to say about Mary. The council was called, and the whole point of the thinking of the council was thinking about Christ. Who is Christ? And if, as the prayer of the church and the faith of the primitive church declares that Christ is divine, he's a divine person, he has a human nature, but he is a divine person, he brings us God, he is God, the second person of the Son incarnate. Then when he comes in his human nature, which he receives from somebody, who does he receive it from? He receives it from his mother. He doesn't receive it from Joseph, all right? Joseph was his adopted father, and this was known uh, in Nazareth and Galilee and around uh, in Judea increasingly. It was known that Joseph was not Mary's natural father. Just what the explanation was uh, for his birth, there were various theories about that, some of them rather untoward and insulting to Mary and to Jesus and to Joseph himself. But it was known that Joseph was not, as we might say today, the biological father of Jesus, but that Jesus was called the son of Mary. She's the proximate, the close cause of his receiving his human nature. And this means that we should call her the mother of Jesus, that's clear. Who is Jesus? He's the Christ, so she's the mother of Christ. But then as Christ, he is God incarnate. And so this title was bestowed on her, bestowed on her the mother of God, as a way to talk about who Jesus is. If Jesus is praised and worshiped 
according uh, to the way that only God can be praised and worshipped, then that means that he is equal with God. That means that he is of divine nature as well as human. But this also means then that his mother is the mother of God incarnate. It doesn't mean that Mary existed before God. What it means is that Mary gives birth to the divine person who is, in fact, really divine. And not just uh, what we might say, um, well, we call him divine because he, uh, he obeyed God and exemplified the truth and the goodness of God. And so, therefore, he has the right uh, to be called divine. No, he's divine because he was the son of the father born before all ages, like our, our creed says. And so Mary gets this title, Mother of God, as a way to talk about who Christ is, God among us. But as soon, as soon as the church does this, as soon as the church identifies the nature of her motherhood, there are a whole uh, host of things that follow from that. And the mind of the church and the heart of the church, which had already been meditating on these things, uh, uh, realizes the first Christian, the first member of the church, is Mary herself. And uh, she does and has had done in her what all of the church is to do and to has, have done in it. And so that means that she gives us not only an example, but she really gives us motherhood. And so, uh, as mother of God, she is also mother of the church. Um, above all of her titles, above all of the honorifics, above all the ways in which we pray to her, this is the way uh, we ought to think. I want to read this passage in Revelation, uh, which goes directly to this issue of Mary's motherhood of all the church. Uh, just to remind us of how deeply uh, the faith of Mary is already reflected and uh, put forward in Scripture and the church's faith about who Mary is. In Revelation chapter 12, a great portent, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and her head, on her head a crown of twelve stars, she was pregnant and was crying out in birth pangs, in the agony of giving birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child so that he might devour her little child as soon as it was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, so that there she can be nourished for 1,260 days. And when the dragon saw that he'd been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent into the wilderness to her place where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time. Then from his mouth the serpent poured water like a river after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to, help, to the help of the woman. It opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. When we look at the motherhood of Mary, and especially as we reflect upon her in the beauty of flowering spring, it's also important to remember that she is involved in a great battle. This is a battle of cosmic proportions. And if she's involved in it, and she is mother of the church and represents the church, then it means that the church is involved in a cosmic battle. Fundamentally, not against flesh and blood and the powers of the world, but fundamentally against uh, that angelic power which has turned against God from the very beginning, the prince of this world and his angels 
who is making war on the rest of her children. That's us. We who keep God's commandments and hold the testimony of Jesus. What we see in this portion of Revelation, like we do in a certain sense in the whole book of Revelation, is that in this battle, our victory is guaranteed. And this means that we constantly have recourse to the intercession of the mother of the church herself, whose victory has been guaranteed by her assumption and her crowning queen of heaven and earth. She's been saved from the fiery, watery attacks uh, of the dragon. And as she has been saved, so will we. So we think about this rhythm of spring and the issue of Mary in the month of May, and we remember, uh, no matter what the dragon throws at us, to try to sweep us away uh, with his uh, scary flood of power, okay? Um, new life is still coming into the world. There's still reason to be joyful, not simply because of the cycles of nature, but even nature itself in our faith is made capable of showing forth the beauty and the splendor and the irrepressible power and victory of the good, of love, of God himself who's come among us and taken us into his family. To have a family means to have a brother, Christ, a father, God the Father, and also on a human level, taken up into God, a mother. 